Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. It's time to take the global stories that have made it to our national dailies this morning. And joining us to review the papers is Stephen Agilde. He is a solicitor. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning, Good sir. Good morning. All right. So we'll be starting with the Daily Independent this morning. And this is quite a funny story because I saw it yesterday. And seeing you as a solicitor, so I feel like you would give us some in-depth analysis on this. So the Daily Independent um, leads with a reps speaker withdraws bill to criminalize free speech others. Um, uh, the writer here says legal experts charge and well, NAS on inclusive approach to lawmaking. So the, the bill at that time, or we saw, was the fact that you will be prosecuted if you insult a politician. Um, Yamgula and I were just having a conversation about it, that who is a politician? So are they party members or a senator or, you know, House of Rep member? Who exactly? And I want to understand why they would think of this in the first place. And is it not against the law to even think about this when we are in a nation that says we should have free speech you should be able to have that freedom of speech but then um there was the thinking whereby let us pass this law that if you insult certain politicians you will be prosecuted for it five million or, or five mm, or mm. Or so many yeah. uh, yes and i have so many questions <laughs> but i want to get your take on this one but it, it's very unfortunate that anyone in a democracy would think of those laws. A democracy is basically founded on the constitution, and our constitution, one of the bedrocks of it is the uh, fundamental human rights provisions. And one of the cardinal provisions there is the provision for freedom of speech. Mm. I mean, those are bedrocks of uh, democracy. You see, increasingly we are seeing in this our democracy that... Uh, Actually, we don't have democracy in the democracy. We have uh, authoritarians. I lived under military rule and all that. And I can say clearly that during the military rule, soldiers were insulted. Uh, uh, I can remember clearly that Obama Sonjo, they used to make a cartoon of him with a big stomach and a big head and all that, and mock him and all that. And no one in the military ever thought of uh, saying that uh, they will criminalize anything. No one went after anybody for such things. They just thought of it as a joke, you know. So what we are having now, it seems, is uh, <laughs> democracy without Democrats. <laughs> they seem to be even more in their, busy, in their innate thinking, more authoritarian than mili the military from which we came. You know, it, it's funny. Mm -hmm. yeah. But by the way, are, are there no laws uh, that uh, guard against people unnecessarily insulting others? Because uh, this one is saying particularly politicians, but are there no laws that if you, maybe laws against abuse, laws mm. against uh, people just misbehaving like this. So why would there even be a need to bring yes. a bill like this to the fore? Don't we have those oh, kind have, of laws? Clearly, there are laws. Uh, the laws of libel exist for that. You know, the libel, defamation, and all that. Exactly. In some parts of the nation, there are even criminal laws that uh, that uh, deal with those kinds of things. But the important thing is that there's a the, the ground norm is the constitution. The basic our basic law in the, mm. is the constitution. So you must always um, anchor those laws against. Your, your right of free speech and all that. So um, everybody uh, can't seek protection in our cause against libel, against defamation. And if our politicians feel that someone has unfairly defamed them, yeah, they can go to court and uh, um, seek redress for that. That is clear. But uh, to just say that uh, we cannot criticize that, because that's what, where they are going. They don't yeah. like being criticized. Yeah. So, uh, free speech gives you a lot of latitude. You can mock your politicians. You can fairly criticize them. So long as I, I don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, for instance, I, I, I say uh, about someone that he, I know he's a thief when I have not, no ground for saying it. You know, yeah, you can go to libel, uh, uh, take a libel action in that, take a defamation action in that. Try to prove that uh, the people that know you 
started to think worse of you because uh, somebody claimed you are a thief. And if you can bring evidence to show that uh, the people that know you feel that uh, you are now a thief and all that, uh, and uh, your reputation was brought into odium, yes, you can bring an action in life. But uh, otherwise, the free, the full amplitude of uh, free speech will protect you. You know, mm -hmm. so that's what. For me, I just think that it's just a case of you know, we'll do whatever, anything we do, take it like that. And do not criticize us, do not insult us, do what not say anything. What about when politicians mm. insult themselves? Mm. So... I said, we were you know, even going I, too far. There's an increasing tendency. You, you, see, you see it in the cyber crimes law and all that. There's an increasing tendency to muzzle uh, opposition voices. You see them trying to use the cyber crimes law to mm. go after people on the internet and yeah. all that and all yes. that. In the fullness of time, uh, these laws will be taken to the higher court, Supreme Court and others and tested as to the impact, the, the, how they will work along with the clear, powerful provisions in our Constitution for free speech, which since, in fact, not before, not in 1999, but since 1979, the courts have been rigorously protected. You, you, you see that in the way... Um, um, issues of national security are being brought to to conflict with issues of free speech, and uh, all those balancing will be done by the courts. Yeah, and all that you see, because that's another way of muzzling people mm -hmm. by saying, "Oh, your fundamental rights are not so important as national security," and all that. We have, we've, we we see those trends that were not there. In, a, in the previous republic, that is 79 yeah. and all that, we see the trends, uh, a weakening of the free speech provision. But let's see, let's see how they will play out in there. But I know that our politicians are not interested in being criticized. Mm. They want to be king, not Democrats. Mm. For me, right, I had only one response to this. I'm glad that, you know, they withdrew, they withdrew the bill. But my, my response was just, how about when you come, you make so many promises during your campaign, and guess what? You get there, you do not do anything for me. But yet, when I criticize you for not doing those things that you promised, you are asking that I be prosecuted and no. pay a fine. It makes that, that was no not sense. an insult. It was just a, a lie. <laughs> a lie. <laughs> oh, it was just a lie. <laughs> Interesting. Mine too. I'm not really insulting you. I'm just saying a few things. <laughs> All right. they, they know, I think they will do it because they know that uh, that's, that's very anti-democratic. It, mm. it will not pass muster in any court. Uh, the constitution is very clear about free speech. You know? And there are many cases, not coming from this dispensation, but from 79 and the 60s, establishing the importance of free speech. So mm. it, it will be, all those cases will be difficult to overcome. Okay. Okay, um, we we have uh, also on the daily independence, um, Enugu Tribunal sacks PDP Enugu House of Reps member at Tigwe. Okay, um, we also uh, find it is not on this uh, newspaper anyway, but we know also that in Ebony State, uh, the people who defected from PDP to APC have been removed by the uh, the court. We know the same case is in uh, in um, River State. We know also that uh, somehow related is a case in a do of the deputy governor and all that. My question is, um, at what point does the court ruling begin to have effect? Because when we look at the River State House of Assembly that had been declared, you know, that they, the, the way they, they are supposed to leave their seat because they moved to APC, they are still having a parallel assembly. And nobody seems to be saying anything about it. I, I wonder who pays them to do the seating and all that. Um, so at what point does the law take its course and it, it comes into effect that if you are pronounced a person who is not supposed to be on a particular seat, you vacate the seat and it becomes criminal if you continue to do that. Because we can't, we can't be having court judgments and then the thing that they have, they have been uh, declared uh, not worthy of being, they are still being those things. No. Oh, okay, we have to understand the way our judicial system works. You would find that those um, judgments that you refer to are judgments of the High Court, which have now been appealed to the 
uh, Court of Appeal. The process will likely go on to the Supreme Court and all that. And uh, sometimes um, there are applications for stay of uh, execution or you know, there are some preservative orders may have been gotten by the people or maybe pending. You see, the law is that whilst those appeals and preservative orders are before a higher court, you re you maintain the status quo. So, if before you file the appeal, you are a uh, the appeal and the preservative orders, you are a senator, you will still remain so until the court decisions are seen through. So that is what we have to understand how the, ju the judicial system works. So, if they are they are still uh, claiming to be senators and all that. It's only uh, pending when the superior courts now determine their status. Uh, they are not doing. It. They may not be doing anything wrong. You see, if I have a, a an appeal and I also make a, a motion for a preservative order, things like stay of proceedings, stay of execution, and all that. You know, I, I can I can still remain where I am. Because the assumption is that uh, we let's maintain the status quo so that uh, the court, the uh, court of appeal, is not foisted with uh, uh, um, a situation where they have nothing to decide. You know. So but don't you think? So don't you think? Don't you think this day of action of or whatever that you call it in the legal parlance? Mm -hmm. Don't you think it's been mm -hmm. abused somehow? Let's take, for instance, what is happening in a do state. They have, take, they have gone to court uh, that there should be a stay of action. So the person who has been pronounced by the court as the legitimate deputy governor cannot enter his office. They are even calling him an impostor. And it seems they will hold this down until the tenure of the governor elapses. So are they not taking it, uh, you know, abusing it? No, I don't think they are abusing it. This is uh, how the law works, actually. For instance, you will find that, uh, I mean, you, you have gone through some of our electoral history. Sometimes a court deposes a governor. You know, the governor remains there while his appeal is still pending. This, this is how we have always operated. The governor remains there so long as he's still appealing. When the final appeal comes to, then he goes. So I have no fear that if the fullness of time, when the appeals are determined, Go. What you should be concerned about is the speed with which our courts are dealing with these issues. And the problem we are having is our courts are inund over inundated with cases and need to find a machinery to move faster with cases. You have a case you filed uh, in the Court of Appeal two years ago and it has not really moved much and all that. That's what you see. There's an attempt to prioritize political cases, which actually is an injustice to people that are non-political. But what we should be looking at is, a, is how to ensure that our uh, appellate system, our court system moves faster. It takes too much time to decide cases. That may involve having more judicial personnel and all that, because when you go to this course of appeal, you see the problem when you talk to the registrars. The cases are just too much. And they, are, they, they are finding difficulty. They are inundated with cases. We need to sit down and look at how we will reform our system to be faster. That's all that needs to be done. If the system is fast, your preservative order will not keep you for so long. You, you get my point. Mm. Yeah, because, because I feel that they're exploiting that. Yeah, because, because they, you know they, that it would take a, it will long, take a long time. time. Um, Somebody can just you know. stay, yeah, stay of action and four years goes, ten years mm. goes. Yeah, they're exploiting an inadequacy in our system. We should yes. solve that. In. So how can we solve that right now? Well, it, it's, it's part of the problem of the system. I, I tell you what happened in Singapore. Singapore actually had the same kind of problem. They appointed the chief justice. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew appointed the chief justice just merely for the purpose of sitting down, not to decide cases, but to see how they can go faster and all that. Once we are ready and we are serious, we can do such a thing. Appoint a chief justice who goes around all the court with the aim of saying, what is wrong? Why Why do things go slow? How can yes. we make it faster? That's the solution. That's the solution. But you need political will to do that. Mm. Maybe we don't have the political will to speed in our judicial system. I mean, you have uh, computer systems now and all that. You can make things faster. Uh, for instance, if I, 
take take one example. If I want to have, uh, file an appeal before uh, from a high court to Sudibu, I have to carry physical files, twenty one copies and all that. Move from one court to the other. Interesting. Uh, that, that is a, you can, for instance, say that uh, it should be done by a computer. But yeah. if, if I sit in my, as I'm here with you now, I sit in my I tap a button. The, the justice of the court of appeal should have 21 copies. Why do I have to print 21 copies of my motion, 25 copies of my records and all that? Would that delay? In 2024. <laughs> I mean, this That's is what... what this is what Yambul and I were just talking about this morning because there's another story here um, still on the Daily Independent that says protesters carted away Gandhiji's corruption trial documents. And we're just saying right now that, you know, in 2024, why do we still need to have the hard copies of these things? Why are we not utilizing technology? But listening to you, that means it's true that you have to have 21 pages being, you know, fiscally handed over to the court. Why are we still, still doing that in 2024? Okay, so let me respond to that. In places like Lagos, where I practice the most, you find that uh, we have a dual system. There's an electronic filing on one hand. So some of our processes are filed. They are there. What that is, is on that end, you have the printed copy, uh, which is also there. What happens when you appeal is that, yes, the electronic copy goes, but <laughs> if you rely on that, you will not get anywhere. So you have to also print the uh, 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 physical copies and all that. Why we do that, I, it is really beyond me, but that's how our courts work, you know, and you have to physically move one uh, the physical copies from one to the other the judges have to see the physical copies and all that hmm. you see this is need a holistic uh, looking at because uh, there are there attempts to improve but the only thing is that the attempts are uh, snail speech yes we are moving snail speed we are we, we are I'm embracing technology but we are not doing it fast enough Mm. If we were to sit down and have a, a look at it and there was political will for it to be faster, yeah, it could be done and all that. The case of Ganduji is particularly troubling. You know, we had elements of that in Lagos where the Lagos High Court was bought and all that. And uh, many, of our, many of the cases we fight, <laughs> they all ask all of us to go and bring uh, our hard copies to come and give them again and all that. You know, you can store in the cloud now. Yes. Both of the things I do in my office, I store in the cloud. I immediately uh, uh, I find something, I make sure I have a copy in the cloud so that when it gets lost, I can find it. So why can't cost store in the cloud? Well, you are telling us that something is lost. If you store it in the cloud, you can always retrieve it. So exactly. anybody body is just wasting his time. But you see, we have to get there and all that. You have to know... What you are. If a lawyer in his office stores in the cloud, why can the court not store it? So if they go and uh, that's what all is local, then you just bring the one from the cloud and continue the case. But uh, right. you find that when courts are bought, it does affect the administration of justice. Sometimes uh, they request the lawyers to come and bring their own uh, this state to court. So or if you don't do that, the case just uh, appears to die. It's unfortunate. Mm. All right, mm. let's just move over to the other papers. So this is also on the Daily Independent, but the Nigeria Tribune leads with it, and it says confusion triggers fresh debate over senators' pay package. The writer here mm. says RAAFC serving ex-senators quote different figures. Another says I earn 21 million naira monthly, and that is by Senator Sumaila. Another says, Aquabio undermines RMAFC in fixing salaries and allowances, being said by Atiku. And finally, serving senator earns 21 million naira monthly. I got 13 million naira monthly during my time. And that um, was by Shehu Sani. Um, right now, what do you think about, you know, the senator's pay? Well, they're being paid 21 million naira monthly. And as of the current minimum wage that was just being approved, that at 70,000 naira, that means one senator's monthly pay can actually pay 300 people's salaries in a month. A whole, I can imagine 300 people in this room right now. I'm not sure it's going to contain them. But we're seeing one senator go home with this. 
what do you think about the monthly pay of these senators and even what Atiku is saying that um, they're fixing their own salaries instead of it being done by the RM AFC? You see, this issue of uh, fixing of uh, salary, it's... Uh... I don't know how we got here, really, because you can see that it could have been avoided. Mm. I would have thought that simply what you needed to do with uh, salaries of civil, uh, uh, salaries of uh, legislators, why not peg it to the salaries of civil servants? After all, both are serving the public. So, for instance, you could take uh, a House of uh, Reps member, peg it to a director in the ministry, Whereas you can take the one of a senator, peg it to the salary of a permanent secretary. I mean, these are uh, institutionalized things, the salaries of civil servants, for instance. What, in what way are legislators and senators really different from them? And then we give them all sorts of absurd things, which I must say didn't start today. For instance, why do, you, why do we have legislators? I mean, the United States does not have legislation. Britain does not have house legislation. But the same Britain that uh, our colonial people, uh, in, in, in colonial times, I think they started those things with logical flats and all that. Why do we have legislators? We don't need to house them. You just pay them a salary. Maybe they're elected, they can find where they can stay. In, in the US, I was surprised to find that. Uh, when uh, Ryan was speaker, he was he was sleeping in his office. He didn't. He couldn't afford to rent a, a place, so he, his his office was his home. But here yeah, we we do all sorts of conditions like uh, giving legislators home, paying them humongous salary for what is uh, essentially a part-time job, you know. Uh, when I say it's part-time, but you, then okay, you can pay them. The salary of a permanent secretary and the this thing and all that you fix it rigidly to start with. So uh, even the salaries mobilization, look, I don't see why we even need that to set their salary. If we know the salary of a director in the uh, in the ministry, we know the, what the salary of a uh, of a, a permanent secretary is. You know, we can just peg it to that. The way we, I mean, it's part of the way in which our system have, and the way talk about the court system now, uh, not being fast enough and not, not looking at it. It's the same way we are not looking at this legislative state, where there are common sense provisions. They will tell you that they are not elected uh, to advertise, like uh, Okadi could say, they are, they, they are not elected to advertise poverty. Really, when there's poverty across the land, the sooner we have the political will to do the right thing. If you pay the status salary to direct uh, to a director in the ministry, sorry, to permanent secretaries and all that, and they are feeling the pain of the people, they will check the that's the point of legis, uh, uh, having legislation to check the executive, to check the executive. So if they are feeling the pain of the people, they are seeing the executive stealing money and making money. No, they will they will, they, they will use their powers. Uh, to their powers to check the to check the executive they, you know that, that's, the, that's the way democracy works but here it doesn't work like that you then have the executive giving uh, uh, legislators the the uh, the um, I mean you see the abuse well, what they do uh, they give them constituency projects which is absurd. So our legislators also have executive power. They can execute things. The theory of um, of uh, of uh, 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 the presidential system we run is not supported by what they are doing. Even in the parliamentary system, it's not like that. No legislator has. You can't go to your. You can't be giving money to go to your executive and do this. Is what here we are. We have a system that is grotesque. It is grotesque. Okay. Well, well um, we've always had a problem in the oil sector, and there is pressure mounting. This story on the Guardian says pressure mounts on Tinubu to sack oil sector chiefs. On the Guardian newspaper, uh, do you think that will be a solution to the problems we are having in the oil sector? I have a clear solution to the oil sector. We don't need an NPC. 
Mm. It's not just the it's just it's not just the executive in, in the airway sector. The, we need to rethink why we had that behemoth called NNPC. We need to go back and rethink it. You see, the primary reason for it was that so that we will explore oil, just like uh, start oil. I think they've changed their, changed their name, does in no way. And just as Petrobras does, and just as uh, Aramco does in Saudi Arabia. I think that was the primary point we should uh, um, have control over our oil and establish uh, an exploratory. But it never, NNPC has never worked like that. In fact, it's, it's worked more like an agency for giving, uh, con uh, uh, for giving contracts to why you so get them to explore you say you have joint ventures with them which is not really joint venture because they they then have all the information the you are just you are just an agent to them and all that right so the system is to start with it but we need to rethink why do we have an npc now if there's no reason to have an npc yeah, then let's do away with it. Then, then let's know we are dealing with ioc streets you can have a dpr or some other department with the government busy with, with them. So uh, my own thinking is, I think it's more common sense, but it's more radical. Mm -hmm. That is, it's not just the mere removal of uh, officials on the NNPC. Even the NNPC itself was the reason for its existence. We should interrogate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking about petrol, there's a story on the punch that says federal government inaugurates panel for Naira-based crude sale. So I'm wondering what's... I know that, you know, Dangote, other refineries, even the Edo refinery has been complaining they've not been getting enough crude. Um, and it's supposed to be like on Naira-based. So I'm hoping that maybe this <laughs> this would be something, but I don't know if this will also be part of the jurisdiction for NNPC. But we have to wrap up now, so I'm going to take this final story that says um, power tariff. ASU demands reversal, varsity bills jump by 300%. So we're seeing, um, we're seeing this bill <clears throat> um, whereby um, the, 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 whatever they're using is being jumped by 300%. And I'm sure that is even going to affect maybe the, the tuition fees as well. But I want to get your take on this because there's been a lot of issue with this with our power sector, especially when it comes to the tariff. And we saw how um, Band A customers, their tariff was, was increased by over 300%. And now that's what um, universities are facing as well. What's your take on this, please? You see, this morning, as I woke up, I was watching the television. And then um, Donald Trump came on the, on the television was campaigning. You know what Donald Trump said? He said, I will cut electricity and energy costs by half, 50%. Mm. Now, that's the U.S. The U.S., an economy where incomes are high, more advanced than us, someone is campaigning, a potential president is campaigning, that he will reduce electricity charges by 50%. What have we seen since the power reform program? All we have seen in this power reform program is increase of cost. Oh, it's never enough. It's never enough. Let's increase and all that. What is happening? It's not just our universities. Our universities are going to collapse under the weight of this. My alma mater, Uniben, is just reopening today. It's just reopening. They've been off the grid. They were, they were, they were protesting for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. It's not only my alma mater. Many universities in this country are operating on that street. You see the companies that have left Nigeria, part of it is this unsustainable high electricity charges. We need to become serious. You can't leave electricity to private sector. If Donald Trump in the US is talking, let's cut 50% uh, cost. Don't they understand your liberal economics? Are you are you the one are you the first person that that first encountered the liberal economies that would say no subsidy everywhere? People subsidize. They say so, subsidize things of value to them. They subsidize to, to, so that they can produce. But here we are because uh, because uh, Ali Baba and the forty teams still took over the discourse. All we ever hear is increase and increase of prices, and and uh, presumably the profit profit from it is expropriated from here. We are not benefiting. And we are not producing. Our universities are crashing. Our companies are going away. We are deindustrializing. 
when oh, uh, advanced countries are even thinking of cutting tariffs, the US, the, the UK government has rethought all these things we are doing. I mean, why, why don't we learn from others? So I think we have to go back and think about this uh, unsustainable uh, power reform program. It's not sustainable. And I, th I, I think I, at the very top, they know that it's not sustainable. Because I know, I have read a book by one of the ministers, which, say, which practically says that this, this, this uh, privatization of electricity uh, uh, discourse was done to uh, force us. If, if, if at that level he knew that, and uh, why are we here? Well, let's tell ourselves this truth. This is, it, it won't work, you know? I mean, imagine uh, 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 how many universities now are on the brink of bankruptcy. Mm. Because Unibank was being asked to pay 25 million, in, I, I think 281 or something like that, a month. What, do, what, what does Unibank uh, uh, generate that, that will sustain that? 200, 200 million a month? Ah, let's tell ourselves the truth. I think we are not being honest with ourselves. <laughs> that, that, not the story with that. <laughs> with a lie. With a mm. local lie for Africa. Mm. <laughs> okay, but uh, let, let's take some a few, few more, more stories. Um, EFCC detains Nakon Chair. It's still on the Punch newspaper. Recovers 314,098 Saudi real. Uh, there's been this uh, uh, back and forth. The National Hajj Commission, we've heard about uh, 90 billion naira fraud mm -hmm. in that commission and all that. And till now, I, have, I as a person, I don't, I don't even understand why we fund Hajj or we fund pilgrimage generally, whether Christian or Muslim, uh, for people who want to do a personal, have a personal relationship with their God in any way that they want to do. And we spend something like 90 billion. Now there's so much fraud inside it. I'd like you to comment on this, uh, uh, this headline. EFCC detains Nakonche and recovers 314,098 Saudi real. You see, um, our constitution clearly states, our, our, our constitution clearly states that there shall be no state religion. What that means is that each state shall not favor one religion over the other or this thing. Now, okay, look, in Nigeria here, we have uh, animists, people who worship gods. They have rights too. We have people who are uh, Buddhists. We have people of all manners of faith. We have Christians, we have Muslims. What, what has been happening? because I think we are sort of a, a, a political people, is that we only prioritize, we behave as if in Nigeria there are only Christians and Muslims alone. And then you see some funds going, you see uh, Christian programs uh, uh, this thing being set up by state governments and sometimes by federal government. You see Muslim uh, uh, program, programs this thing being set up by government. Government. These are clear violations of our own constitution. Our governments have no right to set up those things or to do those things. In any case, even these religions themselves, the, the principal ones, Christianity and religion, no one says that you must you, you can use state funds to go and do programming. Mm -hmm. Islam says it is when you can afford it. This, Christianity doesn't even require you to go anywhere. You can stay in your house all your life and serve God and presumably go to heaven. In, in the case of Islam, it only says if you can afford it. It doesn't mean you won't go to heaven if you never go to, go to Mecca. So I don't know why we are doing that. Then, in the case of the, the fraud, you know, there's been two fraud, too, 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 too many frauds in this our system and you see so in the bible you, you there's a passage in the ecclesiastic we said when sentence of crime crime is not quickly carried out sins will abound so what we are seeing in this country is efcc has not been extremely effective in checking crime we must rethink and reevaluate efcc as to its effectiveness as to whether it has been able to live up to its role. We have ICPC, EFCC, 
and all that, and DSS too is even jumping in. So we have to question, we have to ask ourselves the question, why do we have all these agencies and still uh, the level of, oh, this man steals this one today, it's not going down. Shouldn't we uh, uh, go back and see? Is it in the police we should really correct? Because we set up all these agencies and we are not getting a different result. And we are spending money in different places to achieve the same non result. So why not deal with the uh, cancer, with the, where we started from? We had a police and the police is in the constitution. Why not just reform the police? It's the same problem we are having when you talk of the judiciary. You have a problem, you won't solve it. You then create multiple agencies. You think you are solving it. No, just look at your, the problem you have and deal with it. We need to sit down and look at our uh, police force, its prosecution mechanism, develop them, train them, and all that. Let me tell you something. The police, our police force, that I know from all the cases I have read, I start to be corrected. There's no uh, time that our police force, for instance, or anywhere in Nigeria, you have seen prosecution based on fingerprints fingerprint evidence, you know? This is fingerprint evidence that came in uh, the last century. We still, so far as I know, I have no um, um, uh, 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 court decision where the evidence was based on fingerprint evidence, you know? That, that suggests that enough training is not going on. I also know the police is undermanned, my, uh, uh, undermanned. But the truth is that Corruption is abounding because we are not effectively dealing with it. We are not effectively, we must be honest. We have EFCC, we have this and that, but we must sit down and look at ourselves. We are not effectively dealing with crime, and that is why crime is abounding. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, I'd like to take this story from The Guardian. It says, we can no longer afford further hikes in interest rates manufacturers won. Now, we've seen a lot of manufacturing um, companies move out of Nigeria, and the major complaint has been that um, the business environment is not just conducive enough for them. And one of the major reasons is um, the hikes in interest rates. Um, how do you think that the, the government can, you know, help our economy better if they keep increasing these hikes and um, the hikes in interest rates? And what can we do right now? Because if the manufacturers are already saying that we cannot um, afford this anymore, that means even more might leave Nigeria. Well, you see, <laughs> it's um, what we call a catch-22 situation. The truth is that we, we in Nigeria, we need to produce more. We are not uh, very productive. But it's not the fault of the people below. It's the fault of the people at the top. The people below in Nigeria are quite, um, they are quite productive. The Akara woman that sells in the market is a very productive person. She works hard in the sun and all that. It's at the top level that you have um, that you have uh, the worst performance. If we produce more and our uh, balance of uh, trade is better, then we can begin to talk of uh, reducing interest rates. It, these interest rates, things, as I understand it, are mechanism for, you know, you need to fight inflation and all that. And when your economy gets bad, these are the tools that economists use to so, somehow balance you so that the economy does, just, does not go into an uncontrollable spiral. But the first thing is, if you are earning good income and all that and all that, money is coming in from, from activities in which we are exporting things, all these things tend to balance out in an economy. That's what is not balancing out here and all that. Uh, governments are not even sitting down to say with these companies and all that and say, what is your problem and how can we help you? You see, uh, if you are not a new, a neoliberal dogmatist, that's what you do. You sit down with these companies and see how you can move them to the next level and help them and all that. All these things they are saying is what the president and our policymakers should be. They shouldn't be saying it in the paper. 
our president should be sitting down with all these company executives and say, okay, how can I help you? What can I do? And what if I do this, what will you do next? How would it lead to a multiplier so that the economy can then balance? I, uh, once I read of um, Dr. Mahati when he was uh, the Prime Minister of Singapore, he had a habit of sitting weekly with major CEOs and all that. And they would sit down with him and, oh, what's your problem? What are we doing wrong that we need to get right? They will tell him, oh, this is wrong. This is okay. If I will do this. But you know, it will have this contrary effect. So how are we going to mitigate it? Oh, we want to export. Okay, can I, can I guarantee your exports? Can I protect you a little and all that? You know, if you are not a neoliberal dogmatist, you should see that this is what should be done. This is what the countries like Japan and the rest did in the past that they developed. But you see, we have the same problem. You must have serious people at the top in order to do this kind of magic. This magic is called development. You need to have people at the top. That's why I say the people at the bottom, they are not the problem. They are quite efficient. The, the average taxi driver in Lagos, as Hajong Chang, the economist will tell you, is more efficient than the average uh, taxi driver in New York. He plies bad roads. He works longer hours. It's not that he's not productive. But the man at the top in, uh, in, in the various offices in Abuja, he's just sitting in an air-conditioned office. I'm not thinking. Thinking, how would this economy grow? He's thinking, the man in Abuja is thinking about comfort. He's thinking about going to buy Camry. Going to buy foreign goods. Going to buy all those useless luxuries. He's still, he, 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 in fact, no wise man does that. Whereas what he, the man in Abuja should be doing is to sit down and say, oh, this Camry, how can we produce it here? How can we pro produce an alternative? And then you, you will see, if it's not a neoliberal dogmatic, that he needs to support the people doing it. For instance, this innocent. The other day, you saw innocent going to meet the president. Actually, it should have been the other way around. Mm. The president should have been going to meet Innocent to say, Innocent, come, come and sit down. Um, who is this other position? All of you come and sit down. Tell me, what's your problem? Why are you not exporting? The, the, the Toyota that is able to produce, the people producing it, do they have to let? Okay, if you can't export to Japan, can't you export to the Republic? Can't you take over the market? So, how do we do that? This is what development is. It's a long process, but it is basically common sense to say, we are a team, we are on one team. So how can we help? You don't just say, no, government doesn't do business, government doesn't say, oh, businessmen should go on their own, they yeah, can increase interest rates and all that. That's not development. That's not what you call development. You sit down and you say, I'm looking for, uh, 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 my private jet is bad, I need another one. That's not development. Development is sitting down with all these people and saying, what's the next way forward? How can we move forward the economy of this country? They should be the, the drivers, but you, they need your support. They need your support. But okay. we are made in some uh, uh, neoliberal stupidity where, oh, business, uh, uh, government does not go into business and all that and all that. When the United States was developing, did government not go into business? The government not uh, aid, 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 aid export. In Japan, uh, the car to Toyota, when, when Toyota, I was, I was young enough when that soon was being produced. That soon was not good. That that soon that, that soon's body used to used to eat up. That soon is now the Saturday, and we are still we are now buying it. You know, you need to sit down with your people and find out what to do. Okay. Uh, the 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 story is told that uh, uh, Malaysia came here to take our palm oil. Mal Malaysia virtually exports palm oil as the main, almost the mainstay of the economy. What happened? The government starts with the people producing and so what, what they could do. We are here, we have this sort of tropical agriculture and all that. Malaysia came here to see and they are, they, are, they, are, they are making a lot of money from it. Now, we, we in fact, we are on the verge of importing palm oil when people that took it from here are making a lot of money from it. No, we need to sit down. The development is a serious thing. It takes a long time. But it needs some common sense, not this nonsense neoliberal dogma they are saying uh, uh, private sector alone can do it. Private sector, we leave this thing to private sector. No, 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 it's not done like that. Okay, Leba, just, just, okay. Um, 
I promise. I like this the fact that be... you call him the bar. The, yeah, yes, he's a barrister. <laughs> I, I promise this will be the last question. Uh, we said we were wrapping up a long time ago and mm -hmm. we kept on talking and talking. But government begins implementation of zero duty on selected food items is mm. the uh, last question we want to ask you now. The last uh, headlines is on the Guardian newspaper. Uh, the worry is that uh, maybe the days have begun counting, but uh, the, uh, the customs has come out with guidelines, just like they came up with um, guidelines for the uh, student loan before now. But the custom has come out with guidelines for the implementation of this zero duty. And they have given so many things uh, that you need to do before you can import. So nobody can take advantage that, okay, now that it's zero import, I, I will put my money into importing uh, these goods and then begin to bring rice or any other thing. You have to have, for instance, um, the Federal Ministry of Finance will be the ones that will periodically provide the NCS with a list of importers and their approved quotas to facilitate importation of basic food items. Companies to import uh, brown rice, grain, sorghum, and millet need to own a milling plant with mm. a capacity of at least 100 tons per day, operate at least four years, and have enough farmland and all that. So the, the measures are very stringent. The, the, the conditions before you can import these things are very, very strong for me. And I, I don't know how this is going to work. And if you have not met these conditions, then it means that you cannot import. So I don't know if this, this program, in your own thinking, will be a success at all. You see, uh, I lived through the period of uh, import license. And you see what? All these things you are saying would only lead to corruption within government. That's how I see it. When you impose stringent conditions, people will try to beat it. What instead you should be trying to do is to see how you can produce within your country. I know that uh, this is a temp this, this ought to be a temporary solution. It should not be the final point. Well, let's face the real problems. Um, there's uh, insecurity in our country. That is why uh, uh, we are unable to produce as much as we should. What are we doing to address that problem? That's what government is for. Let's sit down and look at the, the problems that we are having that are not making goods go around. Uh, we have the problem of banditry. Government seems to have abandoned it as if it is a normal thing. You know, the, you see the uh, this last protest. You see why it was uh, hotter in the north. It was because of the fact that they are feeling the brunt of insecurity far even more than we are here in the south. Government is to sit down and solve that. This thing they are doing looks to me very close to import license. If the conditions are so stringent, people will look for a way to bypass them. And that's what we had with import. Import license was equally strict, but people just look for a way to, to bypass them. So that's what I think. All this right. thing is going to work. All right, this is where we have to wrap it up on this segment. Thank you so much, Barista, for coming and just reviewing the papers with us this morning. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Thank you very much. We're speaking with Stephen Aguilde. He's a solicitor, and we've just been taking headlines from our national dailies this morning. We'll go on a short break. When we return, we'll be having an in-depth discussion on um, our senator's salary because the kind of senator has revealed that he gets paid 21 million naira monthly. We'll discuss this in a bit. Please stay with us.